Hello there, I'm John Kenny, and I'm delighted to be giving this little talk to you from the Not Far Festival at Nottingham University. Uh, this amazing work of art is the Deskford Carnix. Deskford, because it's named after the tiny hamlet on the shores of the Moray Firth in Scotland, where it was discovered way back in 1816. And Carnix, because it is a type of instrument that the ancient world called a carnix. Carnix, or carnices, were made all across Europe um, in the years between around about 2,600, 2,500 years ago to about the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, so second, third century AD. Now, until comparatively recently, this instrument, or the artefact upon which this is modelled, was the most complete part of this instrument ever discovered anywhere in the world. What was discovered in 1816, 12 feet down in a peat bog, when some men were clearing the peat bog, draining it for agricultural purposes, they hit a metal skull. They hit this. Uh, it was incredibly intact, incredibly preserved by the acidic atmosphere. This is hand-beaten bronze. In places, it's as thin as a sheet of typing paper. It has a, a jaw, a hinged jaw that moves. It has a wooden tongue here mounted on a bronze leaf spring, which is inside the throat of the head. Inside the head, you can hear, I'm not sure if you can see, you can hear there is a ridged soft palate, and it's just the same form as the soft palate of a ruminant animal. So a pig, a wild boar, a donkey, and this, in fact, is a wild boar. Um, here, there is a brain pan. It's empty, of course, there is no brain, but it's where the brain would be. And if you look on the head, these joints are like the fontanelles, the joining part of the bones in a mammalian skull. All mammals have fontanelles because we have to pass through the birth channel. Uh, we tend to be there an awful lot longer than other species of life on the earth in our, in our mothers. Um, now, we're very fortunate that when those men found the original artifact, this skull in bronze, they went off and they found a local antiquarian who was also the local minister. And he very, very meticulously drew it and measured it. It's a good job he did because like so many artifacts in the 19th century, the bits started to disappear. Um, so all sorts of little bits of it disappeared, but we know what was there at the find point. There was only the head. There were no ears on the head but we can see places where the ears would have been mounted. And this section, the hackles or the cranial hair, was also not there. Now, this object went into various private collections, eventually into the collection of the Royal Museum of Scotland, and it was in a cardboard box in the vaults in Edinburgh until in 1955 it was recognised as being the most complete part of a musical instrument, a carnix. And then it went back into the cardboard box. It caused a, an archaeological sensation, but it wasn't on display to the general public. There was no National Museum in Scotland at that time. That came later. And in fact, I played this reconstruction to open the new National Museum of Scotland um, just before the millennium. So, I first became involved with the instrument way back in the early 90s when there was a knock on my door and a remarkable man uh, was there, John Purser, who is still Scotland's greatest living musicologist. He's a poet, he's a playwright, he's a wonderful composer, he lives on the Isle of Skye, he breeds Highland cattle, a remarkable man. Way back in the end of the 80s, John was given the task by Radio Scotland of making a, 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 a documentary on the history of Scotland's music. He was given a 90-minute documentary. Well, John expanded that to 30 90-minute episodes. It is quite simply the most extraordinary radiophonic survey of a nation's musical heritage 
ever made. I'm very sad to say it's never been heard on Radio 3 or Radio 4, but it won all sorts of awards all over the world, and it was broadcast twice through in Scotland. Uh, we'd better not go any further, otherwise I'll be um, getting into the, uh, into the realms of Scottish nationalism. One would have to ask why that is. It is a great pity. However, uh, a beautiful book and a series of CDs was released, and an awful lot of music that hadn't heard the light of day for hundreds of years was brought forward, uh, researched, presented. John's taste and scholarship stretched from the end of the last ice age right up to modern punk rock and jazz. So truly an absolute ambit of um, Scotland's musical heritage. A remarkable survey. And in the last episode, he launched a challenge. He said, we've got an object of world heritage uh, importance, lying unseen, unreconstructed. We really should do something about this. Within a very short time, the Glenfiddich Living Scotland Awards had come up with half the money, which was matched by the Royal Museum or the Museums of Scotland, and John was able to pull together a team of scientists, and I was asked to become the musical consultant on that project, um, the playing consultant. Therefore, I am very associated with his, this instrument, but I absolutely stand on the shoulders of giants. John Percy himself, the archaeologist Fraser Hunter, who is now um, at the head of Gallo-Roman studies at the National Museum of Scotland. John Creed, the extraordinary craftsman who actually not only reconstructed the instrument, but reconstructed the techniques of making the instrument through minute observation of the original artefact. That was helped by um, Fraser Hunter and the acoustician Murray Campbell. Um, we discovered that it was a bronze alloy that doesn't exist today. We had to reconstruct the bronze alloy. Um, we had to go very deep into observation of the artifact to discover how on earth the, the craftsman oh, 2,000 years ago had managed to cold hammer bronze so thin without it tearing because at first John who is a master craftsman in this area was astonished he would he would get to an end point and the metal would tear it was only when the constituents were as close as possible to the original and the pattern of working the hammers was repeating that observable on the original artifact that the whole thing held together there's over 400 hours worth of hammering in this instrument. Now, anybody who plays or is interested in early music knows that the reconstruction of early music instruments, by that we mean uh, the Renaissance and uh, late medieval instruments, is a massive growth industry, and the level of craftsmanship employed is, is stunning. So it's one of the most exciting areas in uh, contemporary musical activity. And make no mis mistake, uh, early music is contemporary music. Everything about it is contemporary. The reconstruction of the instruments is a work of modern scholarship and craftsmanship. The reconstruction of the music itself is often a, 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 a huge research project, as are the playing techniques. My task with this project was to go far, far, far further back than any of that. We have no written sources, no music, of course, no recordings. All we could do is make the instrument as closely as possible to the original with an enormous amount of edu educated guesswork. It was then given to me to play, and I had to ask it what it needed. I'm just going to place the instrument on a stand, which you probably can't see here. I'm going to remove the mouthpiece. Now, most modern brass instruments, I'll go off camera for a moment. Here I am back on camera. Um, this is a modern bass trombone mouthpiece. You can see that it's shaped like a, a sort of a cup, a cauldron. In fact, we call this section a cup. And inside, it really is shaped like a slightly conical cup. That comes into a little hole at the end, and then there's a tube which expands into the main instrument. And it directs 
the vibration of my lips, focuses it, and at every stage, adding a length of tube changes, modifies the sound of my lip vibration until eventually passing through a long area of tube that I call the trombone. Hopefully it sounds like a trombone. Now, the big thing, this wonderful head, that's the most eye-catching part. It's very, very, very important because this is not a bell. It's not like a modern brass instrument. The sound of this instrument doesn't just emerge from the mouth. It's radiant. It radiates all around the head, even backwards. And that's very much like our own voices or the voice of uh, a pig, a donkey. We have resonating structures in our body, our nasal cavities, our oral cavities, our brain, our chest. Our body resonates, and that's what helps to give us our vocal quality and projection. Projection! It's not just air. It's not just forcing things. We ourselves are a resonating instrument. And the carnix works like us. It's not just a megaphone. This mouthpiece is designed to fit a modern brass instrument, <laughs> which dates back 500 odd years. How modern is that? It's all to do with being a megaphone, to gradually expand that <coughs> little vibration. Now, I, we, took mouthpieces from the Gratio Roman culture, from ancient Scandinavian instruments, also from uh, Asian instruments, which are related to our brass instruments, all of which basically have cup or kettle shaped mouthpieces. This is what we think of as a mouthpiece. None of it worked. All that worked in the end was a bronze cushion to stop my lip being cut. And if I show you the end of this first tube of the carnix, you can see that it's that wide. It's quite sharp. I really wouldn't want, nobody would want to put that on their lips and play. It would be like a pastry cutter. No, thank you. However, if I turn this round, you'll see that now there is a bronze cushion. It happens to be very much the same sort of size as a trombone mouthpiece. But the hole in the end is the same size as that. And if I compare that again to the size of the hole at the end of a trombone mouthpiece, you see it's massive. It's much bigger than a modern tuba. Therefore, the air vibration is going into this tube, passing along it, and the carnix is made of a, a set of cylinders that are stepped up. So it's a stepped cone. It's partly a trumpet, partly a horn. It's partly cylindrical, partly conical. Um, there was a great deal of dispute about this solution for good reasons. Since there was no evidence for such a mouthpiece existing, uh, people could ask the legitimate question, well, how can you say that's the right thing? To which my answer has, had always been, um, well, I can't say it's the right thing. All I can do is say that this works. This enables me to activate the instrument and to find a voice in it whereas kettle and cup-shaped mouthpieces do not, then it simply sounds like some sort of inferior trumpet or trombone. And for such a magnificent piece of work, we must imagine, surely, that if these people were sufficiently sophisticated to make what is, in fact, the most complex wind instrument of the ancient world, because it is the most sophisticated and complex wind instrument of the ancient world, and it's not made by Romans or Greeks, it's made by Celtic people, our principal ancestors from this island. Um, we must assume that if they were that clever, then perhaps they also had a similar level of sensibility in terms of the sound that they wanted out of it. This is not something crude. This is incredibly sophisticated, both in its, in its technology and its, in its representation, its stylization of a totemic animal. Therefore, I have always hoped to be able to use the instrument in a similarly complex way, and this mouthpiece enables that to be done, as I hope you will hear. In 2004, an extraordinary discovery was made in France. 
uh, an archaeologist working in a Roman farnum in the village of Tintignac, or Tantignac, uh, in the Vézère region of France. This is a well-known site, but he dropped through into a pit that they didn't know was there. And inside that pit was one of the most fabulous collection of Celtic artifacts ever discovered anywhere in the world, over 530 objects, including two life-sized bronze horses in pieces, lots of helmets and spheres. Some of the helmets were uh, quite extraordinary anthropomorphic designs, not used for battles. Quite clearly, these were ritual objects, uh, ritual dress. Nothing like this had been discovered before. Extraordinary. And in that hoard, or that deposition, because quite clearly, it was a sacrificial deposition. Uh, in that extraordinary collection were seven musical instruments, six matched carnesies and one completely different, not with, a, uh, uh, not with a pig's head, but with a serpent's head. Now, this tells us an extraordinary amount of things. It tells us that the carnics existed in many forms, just like lots of other musical instruments. Why should we suppose that an instrument made nearly 2,000 miles away, but within a similar culture, why should we um, assume that that instrument is the only form? This is nonsense. Even today, uh, musical instruments take on an extraordinary variety of forms for different purposes and within different cultures. But what was discovered with one of those instruments and the most complete instrument, almost completely complete, was a mouthpiece, and that mouthpiece was virtually exactly this, what I had designed. It's a tiny bit smaller, and incidentally, I now have one of only two reconstructions of that instrument up in Scotland. It's part of the collection of instruments we have with Carnix and Co., a charitable trust that was established to pursue this research. And so we have a whole collection of instruments from this culture which have been discovered and reconstructed and are now used for musical purposes, demonstration lectures. In other words, they're instruments that were asleep for 2,000 years and have been brought back to life. Um, finally, I'd just like to say, to elaborate on this business of the finding of the instruments. These instruments went lost. Every part of a carnix that we have discovered has been at a sacrificial site. These instruments were very carefully ritually dismembered and silenced. They were separated, inhumed, as if they were human and their bones were being taken apart and crossed. The instruments in France had got spears stuffed down their throats to silence them. This is an idea with this family of instruments that dates back a very long way. When Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered, amongst the fabulous treasures discovered in it were three trumpets. They're the earliest metallic trumpets ever discovered anywhere in the world. And those instruments had also been ritually silenced and inside those bells, the object that silenced them were wooden cones that actually had the scrolls of life in hieroglyphs around them. In other words, these instruments were mouthpieces of the gods. They called on life from death. Perhaps in the same way, our ancestors regarded this family of instrument, this type of instrument in the same way. They took enormous care with the deposition. In Desford in Scotland, these people of Celtic culture, we call them proto-Pictish. They are a different, uh, a different group of people from the Celts of Ireland and the Scots didn't arrive in Scotland for a great deal longer. The Scots came from Ireland. Um, but the Picts, we now believe, through genetic study, probably arrived from the Iberian Peninsula. We know from uh, later written accounts that they were darker, they looked racially a little different, but they certainly had, they participated in Celtic culture, and Celts are not a bloodstock, it's a cultural 
connection that spreads right across Europe. So we've got a lot of different people that we now call Celts, and they would never have called themselves Celts. Celt comes from Keltoi, it's a Greek word. And Carnix also comes from a Greek source. We have no idea what these instruments called were called by the people who made them. But what we do know is that the Romans and the Greeks encountered Celtic people playing these instruments in battles, therefore the instruments have been called war horns. However, the nature of the instrument in sound and where they've been discovered makes me feel very strongly that, yes, these were instruments taken into battle and this is a warrior culture. We cannot understand this culture in the terms of our own culture, which is an inheritance of the Roman and Greek classical culture. We are metropolitan, centralised people. These people were not. They were nature worshippers. They believed fiercely in independence. They, worked, they were tribal. And anything that was a part of that warrior culture was an intrinsic part of their belief system as well. So I prefer to think of these as totemic, sacred or sacral horns. And that is the way in which I approach them. So I'm going to play two pieces for you. They're both my own pieces, although there are many, many, many pieces for this instrument now. Pieces for the Carnix with string quartet, with choirs, with electronics, with percussion, with jazz ensembles. I've actually just finished uh, making uh, the music um, along with a wonderful American composer, Sarah Schachner, for the latest edition of the blockbuster video game Assassin's Creed. In other words, this is a real active working musical instrument, and what we do through it depends upon the purpose and the nature of the music. It's there to be activated through human imagination. So the two pieces I'm going to play, one is called The Cry of the Wolf. It's a solo piece in which I will attempt to conjure sounds out of the instrument which are in some way shamanic. It's a it's an observation of some sort of shamanic ritual, we might say, or I might say. The other is called The Voice of the Carnix, and it was the first composed piece for this instrument, um, perhaps ever. I was lucky enough to be able to make it and record uh, four of these instruments, sound on sound, with my dear friend John Whiting, master of ambisonic sound recording and sound projection, and I then play a fifth piece live. And that is an attempt to find its wild side. Thank you very much. <laughs> 